Same thing, alternative medicine, you know, uh, alternatives to violence, and then again, there's large-scale recycling, stuff that was radical. I mean, even, you know, even herbal medicine was radical in 1972. Stuff that was radical at Rainbow Gathering, the Center for Alternative Living Medicine, the Rainbow Healing Facility, you know, uh, all of this stuff is now not mainstream, but we see it in cities all over the United States. So the community stays together and it stays vibrant even when it's dissolved, much like I like to think Occupy is doing. Um, true anarchy, true anarchism means participation is voluntary. So when people go to a rainbow, this is really important, this is how the rainbow economy works. Participation is voluntary. Who builds the infrastructure? Who cuts the trails? Who digs the shitters? That's, that's, you know, that's the most difficult work, is digging these six foot, eight foot deep, you know, long slit trench latrines and then maintaining them as, you know, 40,000 butts fill them up on an hourly basis. Who does this, who does this work, right? Um, it's all voluntary. Nobody is compelled. We have nobody who is given the choice you work in the shop making iPods or your family starves. Right? It's all voluntary. It's all motivated with love rather than a repressive state. Love rather than the state or rather than threats of starvation motivates participation. Now, interestingly enough, this is also supposedly the Republican libertarian economic model. Right? No taxes. We don't need taxes. People will voluntarily contribute to faith-based organizations that will provide social services. So we don't need government to provide social services. We don't need what they call the nanny state because you know faith-based organizations will take over all of these functions. Um, let me talk more about this in a second. The rainbow system works because there is it, it works despite a lack of true or full commitment. Many rainbows possibly most, don't really dig shitters. They don't work in kitchens. They just kind of go there and freeload. But the system still works, despite this lack of true and full commitment, because there's a very committed core that can float the entire system, because the system does not consume that much. So even without the majority of the people really pitching in their fair share, everything works because the system does not consume that much. It does not really need that much. The system and rainbow gatherings, the economic system, using standard economic measures is in a permanent state of poverty, which is okay. Um, it's even good because it's meeting all needs. So in this permanent state of poverty, what an economist will look at as poverty, just like a, a you know, I mean, if, if, if everybody walks home from an economic, after this meeting, from an economic standpoint, that's not good, nothing has happened, there's no economic activity. But if you get into your private cars, make auto payments, insurance payments, buy fuel, then there's economic activity. But what's really, really good is if you get into your car and you crash. Because then there's a lot of economic activity. And you start seeing an increase, you know, an increase in, 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 in you know, all, the, all the measures. And then if you, know, if you wind up in the hospital for six months, that's excellent. Because then you're seeing all kinds of sustained economic activity. That's, you know, that's how economists quantify. You look at the rainbow gathering. Um, I, I once crunched out how, how much they were spending out of the magic hat. Because you know supplies just kind of showed up, you know? and it was really uh, it was like something like a you know two and a half dollars per participant, you know, for like a week and a half gathering from one rainbow gathering that I studied. You know, there's very little economic activity because people are sharing. It's not really measured. But I have eaten healthier food at rainbow gatherings than I have in any other you know month or two month long period of, of my life. So it's poverty because it doesn't really need that much. So it doesn't really need that much labor. Just like, you know, um, if, if you go to Marshall Salen's classic article, Stone Age Economics, you know, the earliest you know, hunter-gatherer societies basically spent their time, you know, recreating, having sex, you know, because they only had to work two and a half, three hours a day to meet their basic needs for sustenance. Because they lived in caves and whatnot. They didn't have to, like, build, I mean, they didn't have to build leaky roofs, they didn't have to pay for the cell phones, you know, um, didn't have to worry about fixing the car, heating the house. The Republican model does not work for many reasons. 
Rainbow is demographically different from the general population. People choose to be rainbow, and they choose to participate in this utopian vision. They self-select to be a part of this. And they sacrifice, at least, you know, make some kind of a commitment to actually travel to get to the rainbow gathering. It takes a determined effort. You're not just accidentally born into it. So we can assume there's some level of commitment at rainbow gatherings, which we don't necessarily have towards the Republican plan, the Republican you know, model of volunteerism. And the people who self-select to go to rainbow gatherings are not usually greedy materialists because there's little at a gathering to satiate materialist desires. So if you're a materialist, you're not going to be happy at a gathering. There's nothing to really buy. You can't really like, you know, fill up your SUV with bags and bags of swag, you know. There's, 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 you can't come back with flat screen TVs, you know. You might trade some Snickers bars for some crystals, and that's about the limit of, of your commerce. So it's really a bummer for like a hardcore materialist. Consumerist society, on the other hand, demands too much stuff for such volunteerism to work. More than people, you know, um, it demands more stuff than people are willing to realistically trade their own labor for. And this is where we go back to you know, the neoliberal model. Ultimately, people want neoliberalism because they want a lot for a little. They want to consume a lot, they want to work a little. We call them the 1%, but we're really dealing with probably the... Um, Probably we're dealing with, you know, the 30%. You know, we're dealing with not just the 1%, but we're dealing with, you know, the upper middle class. And in fact, in this society, even if you're poor, you can benefit from the exploitation of global social inequality. So even if you're poor, it takes you, what, something like you work 12 minutes at, at, at your shitty job at McDonald's, and you can walk into the dollar store, and you can buy a little clock and start thinking about what went into making that clock, what were the conditions like in those factories, where the resources come, and then that clock is shipped all the way from the opposite side of the planet using oil on ships, and then it goes on trains to a warehouse in trucks to finally get to the dollar store where they take a 40% markup and they sell it to you, and every along the way is making profit off of the exploitation of the labor that manufactured that. So even somebody who is technically poor in this country is rich by global standards and is benefiting from that social global inequality. So consumer society just demands too much. We are trained to get our satisfaction from consumption, from buying shit, from owning shit, stuff we get bored with, and then ultimately you know, we, we throw away. It demands more than we are willing to realistically work for. I mean, if you think think about what the income is of somebody who is in the top tax bracket, um, three hundred and sixty whatever thousand dollars a year income. How can anybody realistically, with their own hands, the tax income, earn that much money? And then start thinking about the billions that people have been accruing. Think about fifteen million, more or less, here on average CEO salary. How do you actually work for and earn with your own hands, your own labor, your own mind? How can you have enough time in a year to earn, by any realistic sense of the word, earn that money? And if you can't, then whose money is it, and how do it wind up in your hands? And that ultimately, you know, is, is how this system works. People need to have a lot of money so they can consume a lot, but not willing to work for it. So it has to be predicated upon social injustice. It has to be dependent upon a privileged exploitation relationship. So, uh, you know, think Walmart feeding sweatshops. Think even exploited migrant labor that comes to do the shit work in this country. Cheap disposable products mandate an exploited class to serve a consuming class. Since Rainbow is not consuming cheap disposable products, their economic system does not mandate that disposable class. The Republican model, for all of its you know, rhetoric about volunteerism, these volunteers are part of a society that consumes people. <coughs> and they are not volunteering to give that up, even if they do volunteer to give $25 to the Red Cross. Rainbow has produced little waste, which so little they can carry it out of the wilderness. American consumers roll a small dumpster to the curb each week. This hyper-consumption can only be sustained by having a relationship with hyper-exploitation. The rich exploit the poor, we see this, but the poor exploit the poor, who are hidden across oceans, I just spoke about this. The capitalist gathering, 
If we have the rainbow gathering, it's off in the woods somewhere. The capitalist gathering is now global. And no, you know, it's not working for most of the people who did not choose to be in this gathering. Everything that I'm outlining here regarding hyper-consumption and hyper-exploitation of labor also applies to the environment. So this hyper-consumption means we are consuming the environment, we are destroying the only thing we have that is collectively owned, which is the commons. So it's the antithesis, ultimately, of the rainbow gathering, which really is true volunteerism, as opposed to any kind of you know, model. Again, as with globalized labor market, you know, globalized resource production and exploitation removes such exploitation from our field of vision. So long as, I mean, uh, one of the things with rainbows, I, I, rainbows are really uh, seemingly, and you've been to a rainbow gathering, Albert, you, you would probably agree with this, seem to be obsessed with shit, right? You know, it's really important to dig the shitters. That, that's a, the most honorable work you can have at a rainbow gathering because it's really undesirable work. And the fact that you're doing it is a way you're showing your love for the community. So, you know, whereas in this society, we look down on that kind of work, um, in, in the rainbow economic model, that kind of work is socially respected. You don't have to be compelled or forced to do it. You know, you do it out of, out of a labor of love. But the reason why shit is so um, important is because for many people, it's the first time they had to contemplate where their shit goes. Um, in our lives here, you just sit in the toilet and you shit, you flush the toilet, it's gone. It goes to that magic land of a way. Just like all the stuff in the big blue dumpster, you roll your dumpster into the curb, they dump it in the truck, they drive away. These men who we don't love, right, who operate the dumpster truck, you know, it drives away, and then it goes to the magic land of a way, and it's gone. We don't think where it goes to. Nor do we think where things come from. We don't think where the water comes from, we don't think where the food comes from, we don't think where the products come from, we don't think where our iPhones come from. And if anybody tells us, we don't want to fucking hear it because it really ruins the whole experience of consumerism because it creates cognitive dissonance, a little shit storm in your head, and we just don't want to deal with that. So we don't want to know where things are coming from, we don't want to know where things are going to, we just want to be here, we want to buy shit because this is all wonderful, right? You know, with Rainbow, you got to see where your shit's going, right? And if you just like go off and shit in the woods, the next thing you know, everybody's got the runs and you've created an epidemic and, and a thousand people are deathly ill. So, you know, you have to think about that. Same thing, where's your water coming from? If you don't think about where your water's coming from, you don't tap the spring properly, same thing happens. So you really understand how you interface with the world as opposed to here in the land of make-believe. So, our air is cleaner. Right? Our air is cleaner here in Buffalo. It's wonderful. Our air is cleaner. Than what? It's cleaner than it was. It's a lot cleaner than it was. Our air is cleaner because the steel mills are shut down. But we still use steel. Right? We still buy cars. We still drive cars. We still use steel to build buildings. You know, we still use a lot of energy to smelt steel. We still use steel. But it comes from someplace else. And we don't have to breathe Chinese soot. Right? We have to live with Chinese carbon, but we don't have to breathe Chinese sit. But it comes from the land of a way. This is how you gain the system with globalization. You make all of the ugliness go away to where the people who benefit from the system don't see it, as opposed to the rainbow model, where everything is right there for you to see, and then you go back you know, to the egalitarian models that rainbow is based upon, and everything is there for you to see. But the basis here, right? The basis here comes down from, from consumption. But let me, let me move on. Rainbows volunteer. I start a lot talking about volunteerism, right? Comparing the rainbow model to the Republican dream of volunteerism, who would fire everybody, and then just church ladies will build the highways, you know, and, and the bridges and, and operate the subways and so on. But ra rainbows <coughs> volunteer to build infrastructure. The greatest honor is to dig a ship. American society. It's essentially a class-based caste system. We don't honor labor, nor do we recognize love. So the shit work is reserved for shitty people. And a materialist society has lots of infrastructure, and hence lots of shit work to build and maintain it, unlike Rainbow, which pretty much is just keeping the trails clear, digging shitters, running water pipes, cooking, so on. 
I like a rainbow gathering, simple shitters and trails, which are easy and cheap to build and maintain. An advanced consumerist society has an overwhelming infrastructure which relies on exploitive social structures to guarantee an exploited labor force to do this undesirable and unappreciated work. The union movement challenged this model for a hundred years, bringing dignity and compensation to labor and challenging the social inequality of the exploitative caste system, bringing it more in line with you know, the traditional ancient systems whereby this is respected labor. All labor that's necessary to sustain life is respected. But the system, right? A system that exists to provide material privilege to a privileged minority is predicated upon social inequality. Hence, the union movement presented the strongest threat to the system, and hence has always been the system's number one target. Increases in privilege for the 1% and the increases in social inequality that are necessary to pay for it necessitate the destruction of the labor movement for obvious reasons. And I'm not going to get too much into this because we, we've already covered this. But you know, Reagan declared this war on labor when he busted uh, Patco back in I think, 1982. So now, you know, not even our highways, sidewalks, and sewers, you know, um, even our sidewalks, highways, sewers, all of a sudden infrastructure, the only reason why we can flush the toilet is because we have exploitation. We have people who don't like taking your garbage, and you don't thank them for taking your garbage, but they didn't take your garbage, there'd be a pile of garbage in front of your house. So, if Rainbow, with its beloved shitter diggers, the, the high fashion, the highest fashion I've ever seen in Rainbow Gatherings, is um, shitter, rainbow shitter digger ra rainbow screened t-shirts. And you can only have one if you're digging a shitter. And people would wander around and find shitter diggers and slip these to them. And if you're not digging a shitter, you can't have that coveted fashion accessory. And also there was a, a few times I've been to rainbow gatherings where there are people Musicians who would just find people digging shitters and serenade them. Oh, just play music for them because they're digging shitters. So they need some music to dig the shitter by, right? You know, that we don't like kind of go out of our houses to bring our instruments and you know play follow the garbage truck down the street and you know, play music. For them. You know, it's it's unthinkable. Right? So okay, so Rainbow, this beloved shitter diggers, if that represents a utopia, then American society seems to have developed into a dystopia one that mandates poorly compensated drudgery from the majority of its population, while privileged minority wallow in this spiritually bankrupt abyss of hyper-consumerism. So think of the, uh, the Buddhist concept of hungry ghosts, and that would be the 1%, there would be hungry ghosts. Um, dystopia, that's the word, you know, rainbow would be a utopia, because rainbow doesn't really exist, it's just a space and an idea, but it does not really exist, because utopia does not really exist, no place, nowhere, right? This would be dystopia, um, which is good for no one, and ultimately uh, left to its own devices, represents uh, death for the planet. So if we're going to transform this dystopia into a healthy society, we have to start by addressing consumerism and materialism. Uh, what basically makes the rainbow economy different from, the, I think the biggest difference, from you know, uh, advanced capitalism, neoliberalism, is that the rainbow economy does not require a lot of things. You are not consuming a lot, so you don't need to have a institutionalized structure of exploitation to feed that hyperconsumption. And that also is what ties it together to go back to hunter-gathering societies and band societies, you know, and societies that might not have been, you know, migratory, which makes it very difficult to have things, but where people actually settled in one area and had potlatches and gave away, and they started accumulating things, you're stuck with all the things, you need to give them away, and that's ultimately, you know, how you're part of a community, like digging your shit or giving away your labor, giving away all of your totems, giving your stuff away, right? Um, if we are going to transform this dystopia to a healthy society, we have to start by addressing what has created this dystopia, which is consumerism and materialism. Um, the most egalitarian of ancient societies were the least materialistic. Materialism, hierarchy, and social inequality all grew together as one organization, as one, one organism. You know, ultimately, uh, civilization, right? Uh, the long emergency, you're all familiar with that term? You know, peak oil, you know, the, running out of everything, right? The long emergency 
which is arising out of overpopulation, overconsumption driven scarcity, will force us to deal with materialism and consumerism. So we don't have to deal with it on our own, you know, um, it will deal with itself. Uh, it's just a matter of, it's, it's kind of cutting it close as to whether it will deal with itself before or after the planet is salvageable and, and occu occupiable, right? Um, but this law of emergency is not necessarily a bad thing. And I, I, I want to close in referring to, has anybody uh, read a book called Paradise Built in Hell, The Extraordinary Communities that Arise in Disaster by Rebecca Solnit? It's really, it's really an excellent, uh, excellent, fantastic book. Bob Denton turned me on to it. He was uncharacteristically optimistic. I think it was the first time I had seen hope in his eyes. You know, uh, what, what she did is she examines historic disasters, calamities, emergencies, uh, and, and, and including you know, uh, big fires that consume entire cities, earthquakes that level cities, Hurricane Katrina, and then economic you know, calamities like what happened in Argentina. She studies all of these cases and then looks at, in the anarchy, after government, after authority, after everything temporarily disappears, looks at the societies that emerge. And in case after case after case, it was not you know, what we see in all of these crazy, um, you know, crazy horror shows about, you know, we run out of oil, next thing you know, we're all eating our neighbors. It wasn't like, you know, the Y2K bug where my poor friend uh, had to go and hide from New York City in Ithaca because he believed his neighbors were going to break into his apartment and burn his books to stay warm. I mean, you know, it's not like all of this kind, all of this kind of craziness. And that if we actually look historically, when government, when all the, the authority, the training of the state, when everything disappears and you're in this emergency, people band together. At first they're in shock, and then eventually, you know, uh, what, they, what they actually describe afterwards, even after they've lost loved ones and have gone through all kinds of shocking, horrible, terrible, unimaginable things, you know, ultimately what they, what they describe is not the hell that we see in made-for-TV movies, but what they describe is a feeling of euphoria, which they miss after the emergency. And that is, you know, this ultimately is, a, is what has allowed us to really evolve. I, I subscribe to a, um, a, a subfield of anthropology called non-killing anthropology. And they make the argument that non-killing anthropology, uh, they make the non-killing anthropologists make the argument um, that we are not naturally inclined to kill each other. To the contrary, we are naturally inclined towards nonviolence. If you look evolutionarily, nonviolent societies had a much higher likelihood of raising children to reproductive age. Hence, evolutionarily, they were more successful. Warlike societies, which were constantly raiding their neighbors and getting raided by their neighbors, would have higher mortality rates, would have more hunger because food's being burned, so on, and that ultimately, a lower success rate, would have a lower success rate, you know, in raising children to reproductive age. This is back in, this is not in civil society, which has changed everything, you know, with warlike states that are able to defend themselves and, you know, institutionalized exploitation, but in banned societies, which is the way that we live for most of our, the vast majority of our existence on this planet, in banned societies, you know, there's an argument that the most successful societies over the vast majority of our evolutionary existence were nonviolent societies. And that we see this when there are emergencies, that suddenly, you know, we do sacrifice. You see these situations over and over again where people will risk their lives to save a stranger. People who would not give a quarter to a panhandler will risk their lives to save a stranger in an emergency. So, you know, if in fact, you know, we are running into a long emergency of, of, of scarcity, that might not be a bad thing. Um, these societies are Rebecca Solnit studies. Ultimately, a subdued what authority is able to reestablish order. And she looks even at, at her work tied in with my work with Rainbow, in that um, Rainbow Kitchens have been going to these emergencies. So after Hurricane Katrina, it was um, 
two rainbow kitchens that showed up in Waveland, Mississippi, right. which is where the hurricane actually hit. The hurricane didn't hit New Orleans. You know, an infrastructure failure hit New Orleans. In Waveland, Mississippi, rainbows were there within a few days feeding people, and they stayed for four months, and you had this fantastic kind of love fest between the rainbows and your evangelical Chris Christian, you know, yeah. residents of Wayland. So when the rainbows left after the emergency was over, and you know, the authority was reestablished, and, and they, you know, finally said, you, you hippies have to leave now, restaurants <laughs> are opening up, people can buy food, <laughs> you know, pay for food like you should. Um, the town of Wayland, the people, they made this big parade to uh, have a big celebration and say goodbye to the hippies who came and fed them. And there's all kinds of, you know, redneck hippie, you know, love. Um, that book, you know, documents all that. So I'll, I'll close. I'll close with that because it's, it's kind of hope that this rainbow model has a much, 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 much longer history. It's not really a rainbow model, right? It's got a much, much, much longer history. You know, millions of times longer. You know, than neoliberalism, which is kind of a flash in the eye that hopefully doesn't take down the natural infrastructure of the planet yeah. for this little blink of an eye when it's here. Um, done. All right, we'll turn it over.